Hey guys, quick garden update here. And uh, it's kind of hard to believe it was less than a week ago that I showed you this exact plant. I want to focus just on three plants today. The first one is this Trombachino zucchini. I'm a huge advocate of growing this. I think if you look at the health of this plant and uh, its size and vigor, as young as it is, and how much productivity it's already got going on, you might understand why. It's also very resistant to squash vine borer. It's not immune, but highly resistant. The vines are just dense and they're not exactly what these guys prefer. Uh, but this was the squash I showed you when I showed you how to manually pollinate about five days ago. And uh, I have fairly large hands. So that's, that's probably a couple dinners for Dorothy and I if we're gonna do uh, diced up squash or something like that. I will probably take that off tomorrow I want to use this one as a summer squash, so I want to pick it before it starts to turn orange. Um, but unlike your typical zucchini, it's not going to get pithy or anything like that. Only down here will have seed. And so this, from where my hand is all the way up, that's pure squash in edible form. And these are great when we're using them for just about anything. We'll just take that really long neck and put them through a food processor and get perfect discs out of them for cooking, for making zucchini, lasagna, whatever. And we let a lot of them every year turn orange. They become basically a winter squash at that point, and fairly low carb for a winter squash, by the way. And we've got tons of them coming on right now. Here's a new one here. To make sure I gave it a manual pollination uh, myself last night. But I'm not really needing to worry about the manual pollination at this point. I've got male and female flowers everywhere including this little sickle squash which is far from little on the other side and again these are two separate species so all you freaks that tri trip out about squash cross pollinating it won't do it and we got a we got a sickle right here growing right next to our trombachino this vine comes from this side this vine actually comes from way down over there and to show you how big these trombachino vines get and i don't know how big a sickle gets yet i think it's going to be just as crazy um this vine right here is from a Chumbrasino squash. I've already got another one that got this far and I've turned around and headed it back where it was coming from. It comes from right here. So we're looking at this block right here, six foot. So it's gotta come up about five foot, 11, 12 feet that vine is already. It is a single plant. Come down here, you see it coming up. It's got two branches, but it's a single plant. There's only one seed in there. And uh, the other vine, another squash sitting right there. The other vine is uh, all the way to here by now. And I promise you, if I come, let's do this. I'll try to remember to take a picture. It is about 8.30 in the morning. And we've got this centerpiece and then one frame into the cattle panel. And that tip just barely making it through. I'm going to bet you by the end of the day it's here. That, that growth will be that fast and if not it will be there by tomorrow morning we'll, we'll, we'll do a follow-up picture on that one but that's trombachino squash and plenty of other stuff going on i got indigo rose tomatoes starting to set you can see a little bit of purple on them right there my tomatoes guys i'm telling you if you start using aspirin tablets with your tomatoes a couple in the cup when you start your seed a couple in the ground when you put your, your plants out and about once a month stick three of them around your plant and water it in this is what you have to look forward to. Usually blight is, is everywhere on tomatoes by now. This year, I don't even have a speck of it yet. I'm sure I'll have some, but all that matters is that the tomatoes survive it and keep producing. That's all that matters. Okay, so Trumbacino squash, done. Next, I wanna to talk to you about this uh, dragon's tongue or dragon's tail or rat tail, whatever the hell they call it, radish. First year I've ever grown these. And this is kind of what you're looking for with these. This radish, you don't actually eat the root. I'm pretty, pretty sure you could. But this is your edible, this little uh, seed pod right here. I do that with daikon as well. Personally, I kind of prefer daikon to these. These are a little bit more um, heavier hitting with the radish flavor. The daikon seed pods, when you fry them, are really mild. I haven't fried one of these yet, though, so I'm going to be interested. I'll probably throw a few in with something I'll stir fry tonight and just see how they taste when they're cooked. But what I'm actually doing with this group of these plants... I'm letting them go for pollin pollinators because the bees just are in the middle of the afternoon when everything else, the flow has stopped. They're all over this for some reason. But look at this. Those are, I'm sure those are well past the maturity stage you want for eating. I'm making this first group of seed crop and I got plenty more coming up. But I'm a big believer in saving seed, not just for money but because you get adaptive seeds that learn not just how to survive your climate, but they actually 
become, I don't know exactly how to put this, they have an affinity for the microfauna that you have on your property, your soil organisms. And they, they become adaptive to that soil biology. And that's why they tend to do so much better. So I'm gonna get a huge seed crop out of this. I'm gonna save a bunch of it. I'll, I'll probably barter some or give some away or something at the fall workshop. So uh, again, I can't remember if they call this dragon's tail or dragon's tongue or whatever, but it's really cool. And I wanted to show you something about it that I don't know if this is a genetic um, mutation or what. And I don't know if I save the seed from this one plant, if it will reproduce this way. But I have this one plant or one branch of a plant. I'm not even sure. I haven't really sleuthed it out yet. It's growing green pods. Now, if you look... It's got a little bit of the rose color in it. It is definitely not a daikon that sneaked in or something like that because daikons don't do this. They make pretty small seed pods. So that's gonna be interesting. I'll, I'll note that seed when I harvest it, I'll plant it and see if it reproduces to a green. Because I personally think if you got the smaller size you're gonna eat and you had green and red together in something, it would look really, really cool. So, that's the, the dragon's tail or dragon's tongue or rat tail, whatever the heck they call it, but I like it. Last thing I want to talk to you about today is this little plant here. It's just starting to want to reproduce. Put my hand back. Now you really can't see it there. Right there. It's called a mouse melon or a Mexican sour gherkin. It's a cucumber family member, and it only gets about the size of a grape. And it looks like a little mini watermelon. That's why they call it mouse melon. And uh, as you can see, this is a single plant. It's, uh, it's a pretty aggressive grower, but it's a pretty small plant. You see the size of the leaf. Like that's a, about as big as a leaf will get right there. So I'm afraid in time, this is one of those giant squashes right here that you just looked at. And over here, this is a snake bean and they get pretty crazy over time too but eventually it might kind of eat these guys and they may not get enough sun. I've got an open trellis over there. I'm probably gonna start some more of this. And I'm sure I'll get plenty of them before they uh, succumb to being consumed by their relatives. But these are awesome. Here's a little one here. Maybe I can get a good view of it. They're delicious out of hand. They're kind of crunchy. They kind of taste cucumber-esque, uh, but they're really, really crunchy. They're great pickled and they are great lacto-fermented. And, uh, once it starts producing, as tiny as they are, you can see there's little nodes everywhere. This will just be loaded with them. And it's another plant that I highly encourage you to check out. We've also got a China Jade Cucumber uh, right in here. I posted a thing this morning on Noster and a few other sites um, of a cucumber beetle on this flower explaining that that's your problem. We'll talk about that in a future video. But we got cukes coming everywhere. We got mouse melons and the whole place you got beans growing here. Any beans set yet? No. Yeah, we do. Little baby beans. Right there, we'll have a, as fast as they grow in a couple of days, we'll have a stir fry with a good handful of beans. Um, pink celery, more radish, more pink celery, Swiss chard, fennel. It's all just banging. The whole place is banging. Lettuce leaf basil. Look at that. I'm trying to figure out how to use that in my lunch today. I'm thinking about getting some salmon locks and rolling them with some other herbs, like little mini leaf rolls or something in that. More of the radish. That is that uh, rat tail radish. I got some daikon in here just starting to come up too. Um, this is an eggplant. I believe this is ping tongue. Yeah, that's ping tongue. And this guy right here is uh, Rosa de Rotunda, which comes out about the size of an apple. It's kind of like a bright orange with some stripes on it. It tastes like eggplant, tomatoes, and peppers mixed together when you cut it up and fry it. German chamomile always makes some room for flowers, like I have the radishes. Bring your pollinators in. Tomatoes are just insane. Again, all my tomatoes are some variety of cherry tomato. They just do better for me. One more thing and we'll wrap up and then maybe we'll say hello to my observer who just came up. See if you can guess who it is. He's been here before. Got some lettuce leaf basil, more peppers, all kinds of stuff. These beds, I still have some room to get planted. That's good. I got still more stuff I want to plant. But check this out. 
Tell me that wouldn't be an awesome ornamental. And it will grow about five foot or more tall eventually. The stalk will be about that big around on it. For those that don't know what that is, that's okra. And that's uh, Okinawan pink okra. And it's already wanting to set little baby okras on it. Look at the ants all over it. That tells me, when you see ants like that on something like an okra plant, there's nothing really they want to eat there. There's probably aphids on this plant. They can't really hurt it, so I don't care. They're milking the aphids. Yeah, and I don't see them on any of the other ones. So that one's probably got a little bit of aphid action on it. If I thought it was a problem or if I decide it's a problem, I'll put a couple drops of uh, dish soap in a spray bottle of water and just give it a quick spray. You can usually just spray aphids off, but that's how everything's looking. It's a bit too early to show you the water lilies, but you can see they've all closed up overnight. Another hour or so, there's gonna be a good 20, 30 water lilies open in the pond. And with that, look who's here. It's the grandson. Morning, grandson. Morning. Did you do your job yet? No. No? Did you come over here to see what's going on first? Yeah. That's good. That's good. Say hello to everybody. Hello. <laughs> he always wants on the camera, then he don't want to talk. All right, we're going we're gonna to cut out. We're going to go get his stuff done. Show me videos of your garden, your update so far this year.